this morning, the first scripture reading in the Old Testament from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, the 32nd chapter of Jeremiah, we reading verses 26 through 35. And if you're using a red church Bible, that starts on page 769. In the 32nd chapter of Jeremiah, verses 26 through 35. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to give this city into the hands of the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who will capture it. The Babylonians who are attacking the city will come in and set it on fire. They will burn it down, along with the houses where people arouse my anger by burning incense on the roofs to Baal and by pouring on drink offerings to other gods. The people of Israel and Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. Indeed, the people of Israel have done nothing but arouse my anger with what their hands have made, declares the Lord. From the day it was built until now, this city has so aroused my anger and wrath that I must remove it from my sight. The people of Israel and Judah have provoked me by all the evil they have done, they, their kings and officials, their priests and prophets, the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem. They turned their backs to me and not their faces. Though I taught them again and again, they would not listen or respond to discipline. They set up their vile images in the house that bears my name and defiled it. They built high places for Baal in the valley of ben to sacrifice their sons and daughters to Moloch, though I never commanded, nor did it ever enter my mind that they should do such a detestable thing, and so make Judah sin. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our second reading this morning is from the first book of Nahum, verse 7. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. This is the word of the Lord. It's good to be back with you again, and I'd like to share one of the themes that I've tried to follow in my own Christian life here. And I'd like just to begin with those words that the angel Gabriel spoke to Mary when he said, for with God, all things are possible. Do you really believe that? For with God, all things are possible. And then I like the passage that was read here a moment ago from Jeremiah 32, where God says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? And again, I need to ask myself, do I really believe that? That there's nothing that is too hard for God to do. And if we say, I believe both of those scriptures to be true, have we built our life on those scriptures? 
Have we built our life on them? Have we embraced them? Can you say that I'm a grabber of the impossible? Because that's what those two verses are talking about. If you say I'm sold out to God's word, I'm standing on it by faith, then you're saying to me you're a grabber of the impossible. Now, how does that work out in our life? It works out in many different ways. And um, I could spend hours here sharing stories from my life of how that worked out. But I'm going to share one of them. Because uh, there was a time in the last church that Karen and I shared a ministry up in Newton Junction Baptist Church in New Hampshire. And we were there for a few years, probably three, four, five. And within about a year and a half or so, I was sharing this with Harold last Sunday, we had about 15 people die. Now, that's a lot for a small church. You know, when you have maybe a congregation of 40 and you have 15 people pass away, within, you know, 12, 13 months. That's a lot of bodies that aren't there. That's a lot of empty seats. And besides that, it's a financial loss to your church. Because those people who died were people who were there for 40, 50, 60 years. <coughs> They were givers of the church. And before long, we incurred a debt over $14,000. I don't remember the exact figure. It was over 14, that's all I can, I'd have to go back and look it up. And we incurred that debt because we borrowed money from a fund that we had called the Memorial Fund. You got a Memorial Fund here, buddy? Okay. Well, we had money in it, so we borrowed from it to pay our bills, thinking that in some way and in some time, we'd be able to pay the fund back. But it got really bad, and people began to worry, and uh, we were a church that met every month for a business meeting. And uh, at one of those business meetings, somebody says, Pastor, are you thinking about leaving? Because usually what happens when things turn sour, pastors go. And I was over my five year, you know, most pastors stay for five years, then church hop to another church and that kind of thing. And I said, no, I said, I'm here. And I said, I believe that God is gonna do something great to take care of this problem. You know, and I'm sure everybody sitting there that night said, oh, it's nice that he said that, but it's never going to happen. You ever been in meetings like that? I have, a lot of them. And so I didn't have no clue how God was going to work this out. The only thing I knew was that as a man of God, I was a grabber of the impossible. I believe that God's hand was on that church. I believe that God wanted to do something great in that ministry. And lo and behold, we had a woman in our church, Eleanor Gale, who wanted to live to be a hundred, right Karen? Well, God said, no, you're not gonna live to be a hundred. And she went home to be with the Lord. And little did we know, nobody knew, she had put the church in her will. And so the probate uh, officer, whoever that guy was, his correct title might not be that, but whoever down there in the counties is in charge of dispensing the checks and stuff, sent me a letter 
saying that the Newton Junction Baptist Church was going to get a check for over $16,000. Whoa! That's great. So I told no one. But when the check arrived, on the following Sunday, I took it into church, and when we were going to have the offering, I put the check in the offering plate. And that was the only thing that was in the offering plate. And we passed that around so that everybody could hold the miracle. So that everybody could look at the check and see that the pastor was not mistaken when it said over $16,000 on it. And so that they could use that because somewhere in their life, they're going to need a miracle. And if they're going to be a grabber of the impossible, they had to be part of something that was real to them. And so everybody got to hold that plate as we passed it around and see what God did. Because we hung in there. We believed that God could do it. But that wasn't the end of the story. Because doesn't your Bible say there's something like this? God usually does more than what we ask. Wow! About three months later, 12 people wanted to become a part of our church because their church closed. Wow, we weren't even asking God for that. All that we were asking for was money. But God gave us people too. It doesn't get any better than that, my friends. When you're a grabber of the impossible, God does far more than what you ask. And so I'd like to think about that because the last gentleman that read that scripture from Nahum, it's a great passage. I'd love to spend three Sundays with you and preach on it because it had three different parts. The first part says that God is good. Ah. Man, we could be here all day giving testimonies to that, couldn't we? That God is good. And the fact that God is a refuge for times of trouble. Many of us face troubles this week. Where do we run to? The Lord. But it's the last part. He cares for them who trust in him. Now you get that? God will care for you if you're trusting in Him. And to be a grabber of the impossible, I need to be trusting in God. Not my government. God. Not my wife, God. Not my children, God. And so as we're here today, I want to just look real quickly at what it means to trust God so that you can be a grabber of the impossible because God wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. And so let me begin this way. What does it mean to trust in God or to trust anybody? I got in trouble this week with my wife. Happens all the time. <laughs> Happens all the time. We went down the boat. And uh, the man standing up here is sometimes a little skeptical. 
and I asked far too many questions that maybe I shouldn't ask. So I went down to the library to vote, and I asked the young lady there who was getting our information where the voting machine was. You know, that machine you put your ballot in and registers the number and it's all kind of in there, secure. Well, it wasn't there. They had a wooden box from 1940 sitting on the table with a lock on it. And I said, man, how secure is that? And I've asked her a bunch of questions, and my wife, man, she was getting mad at me. And she said, are we going to vote or go? What are we doing there? And all that I was trying to do was to get some information so that I can see whether I could trust the process that they had put in place. Because see, my ballot, even though it was in a sealed envelope inside that box, would be handled many times before it got to that voting machine. Because I'm sure they had days where they filled that box and somebody had to empty it. Who was that somebody? And where were they putting the ballots? And so I got in some trouble because I wanted to know something about the person I was going to entrust my vote to. And friends, you cannot trust God unless you know God. That's the point I want to make. You cannot say I'm trusting God and yet know nothing about God. But I find it amazing that God is always trying to begin a relationship with us. I don't care how old you are. For all the years of your life, God has been trying to have a relationship with you. And the question here this morning is, have I responded to God? You see, he isn't just going to come into your life without your permission or have a relationship with you without your permission. So he comes to us in various ways. And I was a 12-year-old sitting on a Sunday school bus hearing about the book of Romans being taught. And God came to me and said, I want to have a relationship with you. And on that Sunday in 1960, as a 12-year-old, I gave my heart to Christ. I invited him in. It happens in different ways. That we let God become a part of our lives so that we can know him. Because I can't trust somebody I don't know. Which of you as a parent would give your kids to a stranger to watch? None of you. And that's because you don't know the stranger. There's a lot of things we won't do. Many of you will never go to another food store other than the one you go to. Why? Because you don't trust the other food store. And so, as we're here today, if I want to be a grabber of the impossible, I need to know God. I need to respond to one of those times that he comes to me and says, hey, I want to be a part of your life. I want to have a relationship with you. And in order to do that, because I'm holy and perfect and righteous, you need to receive Jesus as your Savior so you can be cleansed. And then we can enter into that relationship. And it's a relationship where I talk to God. And God talks to me. It's a relationship where I read about life 
and things that God expects of me in our relationship from his word. It's a relationship where I spend time with God. Have you ever thought about taking a walk and just spending time with God on the walk? Put aside the cell phone. Put aside everything, but just take a walk with God. And so, to begin to be that grabber of the impossible, I need to have a relationship with Almighty God. And that comes through having faith in Jesus Christ. Real quickly, I need to move on. Second thing I need to do is to obey God. To obey God. If I'm going to be a grabber of that impossible thing, I need to obey God. Many of you were here last week. We were at the wedding at Cana. What were the last words that Mary spoke in that gospel story? Amen. That's simply obey God. And that should be our motto. Whatever God tells me to do, I need to obey. Proverbs says, don't lean on your own understanding. So many of us get tripped up because we think we have it figured out more than what God knows. And so we go our way and we find that we get in a mess. Remember the story of Naaman, the Assyrian general? He had leprosy over in the book of Kings. And he captured this little Jewish girl. And the little Jewish girl said, hey, if you can get and see the prophet over in Israel, he can heal you. And so he gets over to see Elisha the prophet. And Elisha tells him, go down to the Jordan River, dip yourself seven times. And when you come up that seventh time, you will have no more leprosy. Wow. Seems pretty easy. Do what he tells you to do. Now, there was nothing hard about that, you think? Who thinks that that was hard to do? None of you in here. It was easy to do. But what did Naaman do? Man, he threw a hissy fit. He says, I'm not going to do that. Go down to that dirty river. We have cleaner waters over my land. And so he said no. And started going back home. Almost giving up the blessing that he could have had. But his servants got a hold of him. And they talked some sense into him. And he went to the Jordan River. And he dipped himself. And he came out a clean man. He almost lost his blessing because he was leaning on his own understanding and not God's. So we need to obey. If I'm going to be a grabber, I need to do what Jesus says. Sometimes it don't make sense. But I need to do it. You need to also ask yourself, point three, why should I trust God? I mean, why trust God? I'll give you three quick short answers. Number one, he's all powerful. He's all powerful. Think about that for a moment. Lazarus, come forth. 
after being in a tomb. I think the scripture says for four days, wasn't it? I believe that's what it says. Jesus calls this dead man out of the tomb. Man, if you have power to do that, I want you to intervene in my life. And Lazarus came forth. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And they were hungry buggers that day. But they never laid a paw on Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into that furnace. What happened to them? Man, they came out unsinged. And one of the stories I like is in the New Testament. John has just been killed. Peter is now in prison. And there he is, laying on the floor. It almost sounds like he's laying there naked, but I'll let you put that interpretation on. And he's got a guard on the right side and a guard on the left side. And the morning that was coming, he was going to appear before Herod to be tried. But the angel of the Lord came. You remember that story? Oh, I love it. Came and stood by Peter and the chains fell off. And he told Peter to get up and get dressed. To, as a matter of fact, it says, put on your clothes. And then it says, put on your cloak. And so here's these two guys sleeping away, man. They were zonked right out. And it says they walked through this part of prison and that part. And when they got to the last part, the gates just automatically opened up. Wow, you talk about an almighty God. That's the God I want. That's the God I want in my life and to be a part of my life. Second reason why you should trust God, because he cares. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son to die in your place, in my place, so that we can have eternal life. He cares for you. He cares for you. And I don't have time to read this text, but uh, Matthew 6, verse 26 and following there, tells us of the care that God has has for us, that as a sparrow falls to the ground, even God knows every little thing happening in your life and my life. He cares for us. And the third reason why I should trust God, he's all powerful, he's all caring, but I have here a little book that says God's promises. I'm going to trust God because he has promised more than the world to me. Promises for everything. And I hope that you maybe have one of these books. I've given all these away that I have, and I had to borrow this one for the day. But if you want to know anything about anything, you're discouraged, worried, depressed, you feel condemned, confused, tempted, anger, rebellious. There's all verses here to encourage your life. Because of the promises that God has left to give us victory in this world down here, I'm going to trust them. Now, we need to also say, why don't people trust God? Why don't people trust God today? I think there are three reasons. Number one, they're afraid. Well, if I take that risk, how do I really know it's going to work out? And so they don't take a step forward. They stay where they are. Yes. 
when you're a grabber of the impossible, there's always a risk. There's always a risk. What if it doesn't work out? It's too risky. And so they allow fear to hold them back from experiencing the blessing of God. A lot more I could say about that, but time won't allow it. Second reason is because they've heard of people who have had negative experiences with God. And because of that, they're not willing to trust God. Now, let me just share with you. And I have to always be careful when I share this. 2015, I had a cardiac arrest. Lots of you were praying. Karen was praying. My family was praying. And God enabled me to live since, 19, uh, since 2015 till now. He spared my life. His mercy was great. And the Malcolmus family is thankful for that blessing. But one of the things that was also prayed for is that I could stay and continue to pastor at Newton Junction Baptist Church. We were grabbing for the impossible. But God said no. You see, sometimes in our life, God doesn't always say yes to what we want to grab for. Remember Paul? Whatever that thorn in the flesh was he had, God said, no, I'm not going to remove it. You're grabbing for a miracle, but God said, no, I'm going to give you my grace. For me, I was disappointed that I didn't get that blessing. I would have liked to stay a few more years there and minister. But God said no. And sometimes he does that when you reach out and try to grab for the impossible. We probably have some women in your church today who prayed for a husband that was sick and dying. And God said, no, I'm going to take him to glory. You see, we always don't get that. And we need to realize that that's not a negative thing. But the world looks at it as a negative. Oh, God didn't answer it. God can't do it because he didn't do it. And we got to realize that we have to watch our testimony to make sure that we don't give people the negative impression that God wasn't able. And God knew what he was doing when he said no to me. It took me a full year to get back my strength. And God knew that very soon I would have a hard time maneuvering stairs. Have you ever gone to a New England home that didn't have stairs to go up? <laughs> I mean, and then stairs without a railing? Man, God knew what he was doing when he said no to that. But at the moment in time, I wasn't too happy. I'm not one that was looking forward to retirement that soon. 70, yeah. But I wasn't there yet. But don't let the negative things that happen to people keep you from being a grabber of the impossible. I'm still a grabber of the impossible today, in spite of what happened back there. 
The third reason why people don't do it is they just lack faith. They're like Thomas. What did good old Thomas say? Man, I've got to see it before I'm going to you know, step out of the boat. And so Jesus showed him his hands and his side. And so they're without faith. But to bring it to a conclusion, which I need to do, I'd like to read a couple of verses. Jeremiah chapter 17, for those of you who are taking notes. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the man who trusts in man, who depends on flesh for his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. So all those people out there who are trusting in their strength, trusting in mankind, whose hearts have turned away from God, they're cursed. They have a curse on them. We need to understand that. But, Verse 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. You're going to be blessed. Who doesn't want to be blessed? There's nobody in here that doesn't want to be blessed. You all want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. And God said, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Hallelujah. Whose confidence is in him. He shall be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. He does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worry in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Oh, I love that. Is that a description of your life today? Those verses there, when the drought comes, it doesn't matter. When the hardships are there, it doesn't matter. Your leaf is going to be green. You're going to be bearing fruit because you're trusting in God. You're a grabber of the impossible. God, may it be true of all of our lives, that we are a grabber of the impossible. Help us this day, our Father, to see beyond where we are. We don't have to stay in our ruts. We don't have to stay in our prison. We don't have to remain chained or bound. But Lord, you've come to set us free. Hallelujah. God bless these people. May your word bring fruit and prosperity into the lives of these, your people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.